going on, Jeff? Victor Shambulus, hello, sir. Hey, Ken, how you doing? Wild Bill, Deuces Wild, what's up, fellas? Welcome to the show. Tab Blazer, how you doing? No, Bledsoe, I haven't even flown it yet, man. <laughs> well, Bill, we're gonna we're gonna let uh let some folks pile in a little bit. Well, maybe maybe this is all we'll get, but that's all right. While we're waiting, be sure to uh, head over and smash the like button for me. That always helps. Yep, and I didn't do uh, I didn't do an announcement on on Instagram or Facebook tonight like I normally do. So it may be a small crowd. Or maybe, maybe I'll be surprised. Maybe we'll get a bunch of people in here. That'll be fun. All right. So. Sky Blazer, I did see the T-33 fly. And, uh. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about that T-33. So um, I was out at the field on Sunday when they were doing all the filming of the T-33. I did a, uh, a walk around video of the T-33. I uh, took a bunch of pictures that I'm going to be putting up in, a, in either a Facebook post or, uh, you know, I may do my own video and highlight some of the things that I saw that I think are really neat about the model. Um, you know, what I'll tell you is it's, it's one of those models where uh, looking at it in the pictures, you know, it's, it's a little, I don't want to say it's boring, but, uh, it's, it just wasn't my cup of tea, you know, when I first saw the pictures, but now that I have seen it fly, now that I've heard it, now that I have, you know, witnessed it, been up close and personal, picked it up, seen how big the model is, uh, which, by the way, is surprisingly small, which is kind of surprising for an 80 millimeter. It's about the size of a 70 millimeter plane. It's not, I don't think it's any longer than the Viper uh, from E-Flight. And the thing is, you know, is about the same. It's at, I want to say it's 1200 millimeter uh, from, you know, from the nose cone to the tailpipe and it's 1450 millimeter in wingspan. So it's got a real wide wingspan, short fuselage. And because it's a smaller model with that 80 millimeter power plant, that thing has power for days and days and days. What's up, big go, Mr. Bobby? Yeah, that, uh, the T-33, well, you know, I, I looked at the model, um, <laughs> what's up, Kenny? F you. Um, Shadow, I, I, I looked at the model and I don't, I just don't see very many places where they could have put lights where they would have looked very scale, you know, because the T-33 has the tip tanks on it. I, I don't have a, a, a lot of recollection of where the navigation lights were on a T-33. I'm sure they had them. Uh, they used to fly around my house all the time when I lived up in uh, Elmendorf Air Force Base up in Alaska. So, um, <laughs> yeah, the... Uh, 
Sorry. I'm just not sure where they'd put the lights. You know, I'm sure they could have done like a landing light or something like that. But, uh, you know, if the lights are what is going to turn you off of a model, then there, there probably wasn't much to turn you on to it to begin with. Um, what I will say is uh, the flights that were happening on Sunday with the T-33 were without stabilization. Uh, it was a pretty windy day out, um, you know, 10 mile an hour, um, unpredictable winds, and, and that thing was just locked in. It was solid. Uh, you know, the wingspan on it makes it fly fantastic. Uh, it is a great flying airplane, great flying airplane. And like I said, because it's such a small fuselage, Long wingspan and a big fat 80 millimeter EDF that's got a 1920 KV in runner. Um, you know, running that thing on 6S, dude, it had unlimited vertical. Well, maybe not unlimited, but as high as, as Patrick was willing to get it up in the air, uh, that thing would just go and go and go. It didn't look like it was stopping. It was a very impressive, uh, it was a very impressive airplane. Uh, and I'll be doing a uh, I'll be doing my own video, you know, a little exclusive first look of the walk around and talking with James and Patrick about some of the uh, the characteristics and things like that. It's an impressive plane, dude. And I think you guys, the the ones that can appreciate the airframe, are really in for a treat. Uh, it's a great flying model. You will not be disappointed. And it's got it's got everything that makes a free wing model great. It's got a fantastic, uh, one of the things that they didn't really focus on, I think during the launch video and the build uh, was like the front landing gear. I don't think that there's enough, you know, stock photos of what the front gear looks like. Uh, the front gear, uh, the suspension is very similar to like the F-18. You know, it's a short trailing link suspension uh, with a smaller uh, front wheel. And the, the main gear, are very similar to the uh, to the Avanti. You know, it's a bigger uh, diameter wheel uh, with that same, you know, big trailing link, very easy uh, suspension. Uh, we did some grass ops with it. It did some, uh, it, it handled the grass no problem. Um, you know, and I think that folks that are, yeah, transitioning into EDFs or are looking for something between a smaller EDF and the big 90s are really going to find a sweet spot there. And now they've got, you know, a, a little wider variety of models to choose from where they've got the Avanti S, you know, if you like sport planes, uh, you know, you've got the, the L39, which is also an incredible flyer. And now you've got that T33. So you've got a little more variety. And I think that all of those in that 80 millimeter package are going to run great. Um, you know, anybody that buys one, you will not be disappointed. If you like the T33, do not hesitate. Buy it today. It's a fantastic plane. All right. So I was a little upset with FedEx. The other day, you know, I'll, I'll stop talking about the T-33 for now because I don't have one here, um, you know, but like I said, I will be, uh, I will be putting out a video about it uh, probably here um, either tonight or tomorrow, um, you know, just to kind of a follow up to Motion's video, um, you know, just some of my own vid footage and my own um, uh, walkthrough of the model. Uh, to show you guys, you know, some of the things that they may not have shown you in the motion uh, video. So, exclusive first look. It'll be cool. Um, now, what I do have, and I don't really want to, I don't really want to jump into it too much tonight, uh, is I've got, uh, I've got Rackham Roy's AR636 receiver. I know I was, uh, I was a little pissed off at uh, at FedEx on Saturday this stuff was supposed to get here Saturday but the uh, the receiver showed up on Sunday who knew FedEx delivered on Sunday uh, so we're gonna get this set up for uh, for Wreck'em Roy 
Um, now, Rekham Roy only has a DX6E transmitter. So we're going to have to get very creative because he's got a six-channel plane that he's wanting to put this in. You know, so he's got his throttle, aileron, elevator, rudder, gear, and flaps are taking up his six channels. So how do we also get him, you know, uh, a safe mode? And I've talked with Roy a little bit, and we're going to look at, uh, at possibly mixing that with flaps or his gear or something like that and, uh, and making things... It's just going to make things a little more interesting. Hal Rufner, welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. We'll go ahead and throw a wrench at Mr. Rufner. All right. So I know Ryan, uh, you know, he's all worried about people, uh, people judging him for looking at the chat. Mike SSI, welcome, welcome to the show. Man, the chat is moving too fast, guys. <laughs> We're gonna give Mike a wrench. Uh, uh, Bobby, I am, I am excited for Thursday and I hope you guys don't disappoint. <laughs> I, I am looking forward to whatever it is. Uh, I'm sure that it'll be exciting stuff. Um, you guys seem excited about it, and I hope that... Uh, I, I hope that it's, it's something that the entire community can be excited about instead of only half of us. <laughs> Because you know, I, I think that that's kind of the, the roll of the dice with a lot of these models is, you know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose when these companies produce these models. I, I think that the, the T-33, you know, it's kind of a hit and miss, you know. I mean, even in the chat, there's, a, you know, it's about a 50-50 mix of folks that love it and folks that just don't care for it. Um, I just got here. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. <laughs> yeah, me, the deuce is wild. I'm, you know, the airliner, I think it looks great, uh, but I just have no interest in owning a big fat airliner. Um, it's awesome. I've seen them fly. Um, they fly great. Uh, in high winds, you know, because it's got such a long, long wingspan, I think in high winds it does get carried around a little bit. So the the uh, the airliner does do very well with a gyro enabled or a gyro installed. Um, but it's just not for me. Uh, I'm not a I'm not a big you know airliner buff. I don't want you know a big seven thirty you know a big seven thirty seven in my hangar. I like the sport jets. I like warbirds. I like military jets, and uh, you know the airliners just not not my thing. But I think that they scratched an itch that a lot of people had because it's obviously been a great seller for them. So you know it, it is what it is, and, and I'm glad that they're doing this, man. I, I'm glad that Motion is doing something where where they're catering to people that want something a little different, that aren't necessarily looking for, uh, you know, the next sport jet or the next military jet or the next, you know, warbird, whatever. For them to release that airliner, um, you know, again, kind of a gutsy move. Um, same with the T-33. You know, it, it, it is going to come with some mixed reviews. And that's okay, because I think that everybody that's flown the, uh, the AL-37, they love it. Everybody that has bought one, everybody who's it's got scratched by the AL-37 absolutely loves the model. And I think that that's going to be the same reaction with the T-33. It's a great model. Um, maybe not necessarily my cup of tea, maybe not something that I will own, but it is a great-looking model, and... 
uh, people that buy it are going to love it. It is fantastic. Um, you know, I think people are going to love the speed. They're going to love the power. I'm telling you, that thing scoots on an 80 millimeter EDF. Like I said, the, the fuselage is about the same size as the Viper 70 millimeter from E-Flight uh, with a 1450 millimeter just straight wingspan. I mean, that thing is awesome. That 1920 KV in runner, uh, 80 millimeter, that thing, it'll get up and go. The people are really gonna like that T33 a lot, I think. All right, so the next thing I wanna talk about tonight is uh you know i already i already hit up the as3x uh the ar636 receiver that we have for wreck and roy um like i said we're going to talk to wreck and roy a little bit figure out what he wants to do i already know the plane that he's going to put it in and that's going to be the uh, uh it's actually a free wing model it is the free wing uh before they did the separation of free wing and flight line it is the free wing p51 old crow um it's a 1400 or 1420 uh, millimeter P51 Mustang uh, that we're going to be putting this in and it's a high performance um, you know Roy's done some modifications to it uh, where the thing will get up to about 90 miles an hour uh, so he needs that stabilization and he's also wanting safe so uh, we're gonna have to get a little creative but um, <clears throat> I will be documenting the process and releasing a series on how to program the AS3 hex receivers uh, and and here it is. So Roy, if you see this in uh, on the replays, because I'm not sure if you're here right now or not, I got your receiver, buddy. We're gonna get this thing programmed, and we're gonna get it sent out to you. And uh, you know, my understanding from Roy is he's not too computer savvy. Uh, you don't have to be a computer genius. Uh, during the course of my um, you know putting everything together in the series that I'm gonna put together. Anybody that's in Roy's area that, you know, can even turn on a computer uh, and is not afraid of uh, clicking a few buttons here and there should be able to help him with the, the finishing touches. I don't have a P51 Old Crow here, uh, so I'm not going to be able to do everything that needs to be done on the model, but we're going to be able to get it about 90% there, and if someone can give him a hand, you know, with that last 10%, uh, Roy's going to love this thing. Oh, <laughs> uh, Jeff Tui, I don't think they need to be. Um, you know, just a regular four channel or six channel, nine channel receiver without, you know, without AS3X doesn't need to be programmed, but all of the Spectrum AS3X receivers are programmable. Uh, you just have to have, uh, I keep like a little box on the desk here. Uh, you got to have the programming uh, cable, and in this little guy, I keep both the, you know, the USB cable and the Bluetooth dongle. So this is the little Bluetooth dongle that you plug into the programming port, and this is the USB cable. So, uh, yeah, all of their AS3X uh, receivers are programmable. And the new one, the AR637T is going to be forward programmable, uh, which means that you will be able to do all of the programming without hooking it up to a PC or without using like a Bluetooth dongle to program it through a phone app. You'll be able to do all of that from a Gen 2 or better or transmitter. You know, so like your DX6, your DX8, your DX9, uh, the DX6 Gen 3, DX8 Gen 2, DX9. Uh, DX18, DX20, IX12, and IX20 transmitters will be able to f um, will be able to uh, program the AR637 on your AS3X, your safe settings, server reversing, all of that stuff you'll be able to do from the transmitter, uh, and they're taking you, you know that that intimidating step of having to do it from a PC out of the equation. So hopefully it'll open. Uh, open the doors to using the AS3X gyros to a lot more customers, uh, especially the folks that don't want to program anything on a computer first.
Wayne, what's going on? Pilot Ryan, good to see you. Welcome to the show. Goodyak, so the, the rumors are uh, are true that with throttle management, I can get 10, you know, 10 and 20 minute flight times out of the Havoc. Me too, Ryan. I got some special footage I'm going to be putting up. Um, you know, and I'm sure you've got uh, you've got a lot of preps to do for Thursday, unless all that's already done. So, uh, <coughs> Biff, there you go. Yeah, with that DX8 Gen 2 with an AR637. Um, uh, yeah, with the AR637T uh, receiver. That DX8 Gen 2 will be able to program all the AS3X and safe settings, panic button, all that stuff you'll be able to program right from the radio. So I think that that's, gonna, that's really going to open the doors for folks. <laughs> yes, yeah, same here, Ryan. All right. So we talked about the T33. Ryan, you missed it, but that's okay. There's going to be lots of videos about it. Um... I got to see the T-33 fly on Sunday. It's a great flying bird. Anybody who wants one, grab one. You're absolutely going to love that model. It is fantastic, and it's got gobs and gobs and gobs of power. It's a small fuselage, big wings, huge EDF unit, 1920 kV inrunner, and it loves 6,000 milliamp hour batteries. Huge cavernous uh, battery uh bay in that thing you could probably fit you know i don't know that you'd want to go as light as like a 4000 you probably could and it would fly fine but it's pretty light on a 5000 it seemed to really like the weight of the 6000 and now with the spectrum 7000 batteries i think that you could probably go up to like a 7000 uh, spectrum or even the bigger admirals uh, and you're going to have it's going to behave even better on a better on a bigger battery uh, than it does on the 5000s. The 5000s, you know, uh, they were able to uh, Patrick, who was flying it, was able to get about four and a half minutes of uh, a flight out of it. Uh, and you know, of course, that was with some throttle management. If you're ball to the wall the whole time, you're only going to get your standard three minutes. Uh, but with some throttle management, he was able to get about four four and a half minutes of flight out of the T33 uh, and that was on a 5,000 battery. On the 6,000, uh, you know, he was a little more, a uh, little more liberal with the throttle and was still able to get about four, four and a half minute flight times out of it. So it's a great plane. Um, ah, Shadow Man. Hope you feel better, buddy. Uh, Bobby, that was set to uh, throttle time only. Um, so, it, with the throttle above 25%. JB uh, Linden, I think that that was... <laughs> that was based on the camera time, which included taxi and things like that. Uh, so, you know, shave about a minute off of those times, and I think that you're getting into more realistic numbers. Sorry, I'm not going <laughs> to... I guess I'll tell the truth behind the video editing that happens at the field. You know, I don't want to blow James's cover or anything. <laughs> um... And, you know, it may have been, it, it may have been where, um, I, I do think with the 6,000s, we were seeing about six, six and a half minute flight times out of it with some throttle management. And that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, behind the blow. That's funny. Greg Beaven. Welcome to the show, man. Oh, absolutely, Farmer Man. The, um, the airplane is going to do really well. Uh, I think that it, like I said, I can't say it enough. Anybody that likes the way the T-33 looks is going to absolutely love the way that the T-33 performs. 
it is an awesome airplane uh, as far as performance goes. You guys are going to love the thing. You're going to love it. And the scale details are pretty fantastic, too. I really like the, the full, uh, you know, and I, yeah, I know they're spring-loaded, but it's got the same type of uh, spring mechanism as the F-18, you know, for both the front gear and the, uh, the rear, uh, the main gear. Um, and they look very scale, you know, as the gear is coming up and the inner doors, you know, close in on top of the main gear. It's all very scale looking, very nice. Um, uh, very nice trailing link suspension on both the front gear and the, uh, the main gear and excellent grass performance. It, it may be big go. I haven't, well, uh, I take that back. I, of course I've seen an L39. Uh, I don't own one, so I'm not as intimately familiar, uh, with, the uh, the wheels and the gear on the L39 as I am on the Avanti. The rear gear looks very similar to the Avanti. Long trailing links um, and, and a good amount of suspension travel on the rear gear. So it handles uh, grass operations fantastic. Race 22 crew. Welcome to the show, man. Buy it today, farmer man. Red Baron, what's going on? All right, guys. Uh, the other thing that I got, and uh, I'm not sure that this was put out on any of the motion videos, um, and uh, hopefully this will, um, hopefully this will come to fruition. My understanding is that they're looking at. Um, as soon as next week to start shipping on that on that T33. So uh, apparently they put some uh, some turbos on the boat from China. Uh, so get ready. A anybody who pre-ordered it, um, you know, get ready to start having some fun, man. All right. So the last thing or not the last thing, you know, of course we'll, we'll go as long as people want to sit around and, and talk. Um, but I want to talk about this thing sitting behind me. So I'm going to, I'm going to get up and jump behind the table and we're going to, uh, we're going to play around with the Havoc guys. Cause this thing is, it is not the same as the first Havoc that came out. And, uh, you know, Ryan and everybody else who told me, uh, you know, the pictures don't do it justice. The damn, the green on this model is way better looking in person than it is. I mean, even on the picture on the box. Um, yeah, it's not a slow boat from China, man. Uh, Kenny's right, but they put this thing on a freaking... <laughs> On the speedboat from China, uh, it, yeah. Uh, apparently, it's supposed to be. Uh, it's supposed to be here, I, I believe. James was saying by next Friday, maybe even this Friday. Hell, uh, that'd be awesome for you guys. So, you know, we'll see. I, I think here in the next week or two, uh, we're gonna have um, we're gonna have some T33s out in the wild, and I think that you guys that get them will be able to. Uh, you know, just solidify what I'm saying now that that thing is a, it's a remarkable aircraft. It really is. Uh, and I reserve that, that judgment for, for very good airplanes. If an airplane sucks, I'll tell you, uh, it's, it doesn't have the looks that I like, but it is a great performer. And the one thing that I'll tell you, um, that I haven't mentioned yet, that was very impressive with the T-33 is how well it knife edges. Cause I'll tell you the, the rudder on that thing is maybe about one inch. So it's got this tail section that comes back on the back of the airplane. The rudder's maybe an inch, inch and a half. It's a tiny, tiny rudder. But that thing has like great rudder authority. Um, you know, and you can turn it on its side and knife edge all day long with that itty bitty rudder on the back of the, uh, on the, back of the vertical stabilizer. It's very, it's a very well-tuned and great flying model. I really think you guys are going to love it.
All right, so I'm gonna jump up. I'm gonna push this table forward a little bit and uh, we're gonna unbox the Havoc, guys, because this is not, like I was saying, this is not the Havoc that shipped uh, when the Havoc was first released. This is what I believe to be like a V2 Havoc, even though they're not advertising it as such. There's been some changes to this model uh, to address some of the, uh, the concerns from the community and uh, you know a lot of the concerns uh, that were that were noticed in the beginning. So let's take a look. We're gonna, we're gonna pull it on forward, boys. Is that is that too buku? Yep, so for you guys that have seen a Havoc before, you know, this is nothing new, but uh, this is my first time opening one up, and uh, I did crack it open just a little bit earlier, uh, just to make sure that this was, in fact, like the V2 version of the model, and not the, uh, the one that was shipping from day one. So I did get the newer version, even though it doesn't say V2 on it, there have been some changes made to this. So let's go ahead and get it cracked open and take a look. I'm still trying to read the chat, but it's, it's much smaller. All right. This is a big box, man. I don't know that my little, uh, my little area to open it up here is going to be big. Enough. I'm about to start knocking things on the walls. a builder so uh, you know somebody can sit here in the back and and take airplanes out of the box while I keep talking to people all right there we go All right, guys, so, you know, very typical E-Flight, you know, FMS packaging. Everybody knows what to expect from these guys. Uh, E-Flight and Motion are the best at what they do, E-Flight and, uh, and Free Wing. So, no surprises that it's packaged well. And let me grab... Grab a little bark cutter and get some of these uh, pieces of tape cut. God, why do they have to put so much tape? One piece would have held it. All right. So guys, we're not going to do like a full build on the Havoc because I think that plenty of people have seen build videos on Havocs. And, I, you know, I'm going to do like a full build video but not here on the live show, right? What I will do, though, is show you what, what makes this, 
you know, what is, in my opinion, kind of a V2 of the airframe as opposed to the original uh, that was being shipped out by Horizon Hobby. And some of the changes that they've made to uh, address the, the issues that were being faced by the early adopters of the habit. All right, now that we've gotten that far, we can go ahead and pull the wing out. And folks that uh, remember the initial release, uh, the Havoc had, sorry, I'm moving a box out of the way here. Whoop. So, folks that remember the initial release of the Havoc will remember that it had like um, like five servo connectors here inside this wing cavity. Um, and now they've just got the individual servo wires there. So you can pull those out and connect them directly to the uh, to the servo leads coming out of the fuselage. So that's one of the changes between this and the original Havoc. So that's pretty nice. All right, and I'll go ahead and pull the fuselage out too because that's where the other, oh. That's not true. So the other areas where there was some concerns were in the servo cavities. Now the servos, you know, I'm sitting here trying to trying to pull on them and it doesn't feel like there's any slop in the servos at all. I'm trying to move those those servos around and the servos all feel good. Yeah, Guniak, I, I think that folks that uh, that end up getting the Havoc in a V2 release are going to are gonna appreciate having, you know, the servo leads just being loose like that instead of that multi-connector. Uh, a lot of folks were having problems with that multi-connector. And uh, we'll go ahead and pull the fuselage out. I'll tell you what, for folks that haven't seen, you know, all the different parts and pieces or haven't seen a build video for the Havoc, it is certainly not a very complicated model at all. Get out. not much to it so you basically have three parts because the fuselage you know there is no separate nose cone so the fuselage all comes out as one piece basically all put together you've got your wing assembly that goes on your vertical stabilizer is already built in to the uh, you know it's already molded into the fuselage so the only parts to the aircraft are the horizontal stabilizers, which just slip right into the back. You know, pretty easy stuff. You've got your two, you know, servo connectors there for your elevators. That just slips right in. Uh, looks like it goes on with four screws. And then you, uh, you attach your wing assembly to the bottom, and that looks like that's held in with four screws. So it's an eight you know, eight total screws for the build. Very easy. I'm gonna set this off to the side. You know, it looks like there's only like three, three main pieces to the, uh, to the entire airplane and you're basically done. So that's very cool. Alright, I'll, uh, I'll get back in my, uh, my long, 
in my lawn chair. <laughs> All right. So, you know, most folks that have seen the Havoc, they already know the deal with the canopy and the battery hatch cover. The, uh, the canopy is, uh, rather than having like a, you know, like a, a plastic canopy, it's all foam and it's just painted gray, which is nice. Oh. Smells like an airplane. <laughs> All right, and let's take a look at the bottom, right? So again, your multi-connector on the bottom is gone. So now you just have a hole there with all your servo leads coming out. So that's awesome. Uh, the other thing that was mentioned, and I can't, uh, I'm not gonna be able to reach my hand back there because of the way that the, you know, that the intake is kind of shaped there, uh, you know, to go around to the EDF unit. But the, the EDF unit is supposed to be uh, better, better balanced now. And I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna pull the EDF unit out of a brand new airplane, but it's supposed to have better balance now. And, uh, and not be giving folks any issues. But you know, everything that I have read about this New version would suggest that, you know, they've addressed all of the issues, uh, you know, that were, that were there in the V1 model. And this one should be, should be good to go right out of the box. Now, I did get the, uh, the bind and fly model. So, you know, I've got my AX, uh, the AR-636 receiver here with AS-3X and safe select. Um, it looks like a good gear, similar front wheel to what I see on like the Viper, but not quite as hard. Um, the wheel itself, not the gear. Uh, the gear is much better. Um, you know, but we're not going to put the gear down. One thing that I like about the Havoc, and you guys can check this out, you know, most of these jets only come with, I am fondling it. Most of these jets only come with like a single battery strap, right? So the thing that's nice about the Havoc is it's got a huge battery bay. I mean, you could throw like any kind of battery you want and it's got three battery straps in it already. Uh, right out of the box so you don't have to like go buy more battery straps it already comes with three you've got your ec5 connection um you know it looks like a very good model i'm excited to get it together and take it out to the field uh and give it a go um it does not have a removable nose comb uh, i think that uh you know for folks that have seen the havoc videos already You've got your nose cone here. It does have a plastic tip cover on the nose cone and the leading edges of your intakes are plastic as well. And your, uh, your ventral fins, your leading edges are, uh, well, all your edges all the way around your ventral fins have uh, like a plastic protective um, shield on them. So it's a, it's a very nice model. Just first impressions out of the box. I am uh, am pretty impressed with it, and I am looking forward, looking forward to see how it flies. I'm going to adjust the camera a little bit, guys. All right. So, uh, I already smelled it for her, man. I'm not going to lick it, too. <laughs> I'll call you Colin on this show, but on every other show, I'm going to call you Colin. <laughs>
All right, Guniak. Guniak is the uh, the FMS Hawk. Is that an eighty millimeter? Their BAE Hawk, or is that a seventy millimeter? Yes. Yes, it's eighty. <laughs> All right. Oh, nice. What? Is the Havoc a Hawk airframe? I have not. I don't know. I don't know enough about these things. It says it's licensed by Elite Aerosports. I guess uh, the Havoc was a big, uh, a big turbine model, you know, and the company that was making the turbine. E flight went and you know got licenses to mold it in foam and turn it into a, a little EDF. Right, so it's the same power plant, uh, and same gear, same electronics, same power plant as the uh, the BAE Hawk from FMS. Jackson, what's up? So, you know, a lot of people while I was on the uh, on the other side of the table there unboxing the uh, the havoc, there was a a lot of folks have come into the chat. So, everybody, uh, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the channel, hit the bell button so you're notified when the new videos come out. You're not going to want to miss the uh, the AR six three six programming series. I've got that right here. We're going to get this thing ready for Wreck'em Roy, uh, who won this thing on the show last week. So that's awesome. Was it last week or week before? I think it was last week. And I've already got it here. Oh, there's Wreck'em Roy. Wreck'em, we're going to need to get you a new radio, my man. Not for me. <laughs> you, you're going to need to get you like an eight-channel radio. I feel the sneeze is coming. All right. Um, oh, Colin, that's dirty. <laughs> yeah, I grow it and then I shave it off and then I grow another one and I shave it off. <laughs> Uncle Roy was in a lake today. I hope on a boat, man. Don't you guys live up in like the Pacific Northwest? It's cold up there. You don't need to be jumping in a lake. Get out the lake. If you need to get wet, go jump in a warm shower. You'll be all right. <laughs> I just got here. Thanks for stopping by, buddy. All right, so we got the the Havoc out of the way. We talked about the AR-636, Roy's little baby that I got here in my hands. Um, we talked about the T-33. I don't know. Y'all want to talk more about the T-33 a little bit? Anybody have any specific questions? You know, I did get to see... The, uh, the airplane take about six, six flights. I think they ran, you know, six to eight, um, six to eight batteries through that thing. GB, no beer for me tonight, man. It's been a long day. I'm pretty tired. So as soon as the, we're done with the stream, I'm going to go crash and go to sleep. Uh, it's the Amy's. Hi, guys. <laughs> Photon, I do. I do. Um, the same field where they film all of the, well, most of the Motion RC videos now are filmed at the, 
at CCRC, the Cobb County RC Modelers uh, Club. And uh, a lot of times when the new motion stuff is coming out, I do get a chance to see it um, before, before other folks do. But, uh, you know, by request, I keep my mouth shut. <laughs> RC Stinger, welcome to the show, man. Nope, nope. No beer runs. No beer runs. I may I may grab a Mountain Dew. Oh yeah, Guniak. Um <laughs> I don't think they'd kill me. But uh it's just not the right thing to do. Um, you know, I, I am, I'm privileged to be able to see a lot of new models before they hit the street. Um, but it's, it's not the right thing to do to sit here and talk about them when, when number one, I don't own it, and number two, uh, they haven't even put their own videos out yet. So, you know, James and I always talk about that, like, hey, you know, if you're going to talk about this on your show, wait till after our video's out. Um, but for this particular one, you know, I, I think James is pretty excited about it. I don't, I don't think that we, uh, you know, that he anticipated it flying as well as it did. Uh, so he was pretty excited about getting the word out, um, you know, and he worked his butt off last night to make sure that the video uh, was out this morning so I could talk about it on the show tonight. Uh, and I really appreciate, uh, I, I don't know if he did it just for me or just to be able to get the thing, um, you know, on the internet as soon as he could. Um, but I, I do appreciate him being able to get that done because if, uh, you know, if that video wasn't out yet, we wouldn't be talking about it right now. So, so that's that. Yeah, Guniak. So uh, the other interesting thing was uh, the the eighty millimeter power plant that they're putting in the um, in the T thirty three. It's a nineteen twenty kV in runner, uh, eighty millimeter nine blade uh, EDF unit. That power plant is going to be the new standard for free wing moving forward. Um, and my understanding is that all of the current in-runner power plants are, you know, that once the stock of the in-runners gets used up, that they're not going to be producing them anymore, and, uh, or at least they're not going to be selling new models with them anymore. Um, you know, so my understanding is that the Avanti is going to be getting, you know, re-released with the in-runner, um, uh, 1920 kV motor. The uh, all of their 80 millimeter birds are going to have the same 1920 kV in runner uh, nine blade EDF unit that the T that the T33 has now. But that's that's cheater information. Oh, no, the thing, uh... Oh, nice, Josh. You can, uh... You can go ahead and let it rip, man. That, that seems to be your M.O. lately, is to uh, release videos during other people's live streams. It's kind of awesome. Yeah, Guniak, that's that's what it's got, and uh, is the nineteen twenty kV, uh, and it's got a nine bladed fan in it, and uh, and it runs great. It sounds awesome. Um, you know, we'll we'll see how they we'll see how they do. 
Um, it, you know, I, I think all plans in RC are written in water, man. You know, you 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 shake the table too much, and uh, and any plan can change in a moment's notice. So, here's the other thing that I'll tell you about the T33, and I don't want anyone to take this in bad context, because I think it was more radio-related and receiver-related than it was airframe-related. But there were times where... coming out of the throttle and then reapplying full throttle, the entire power system would just cut off for a split second. Like you'd hear it spool up or, you know, it would spool down. And then before it would spool up again, it would just completely cut off uh, when, you know, the throttle was only being brought down to maybe, you know, maybe 20%. And then, you know, right back to say, you know, 80 to 100%. Um, but before it would spool back up, it would just completely shut off. I heard it do that twice. Um, so, <laughs> crazy eyes. Um, I'm not sure if that was Patrick doing that with the radio or if it was, it, it could have been a timing issue, Guniak. Uh, if that was Patrick doing that in the radio or if it was the timing in the ESC. Um, it, you know, it'd be nice if, uh, for the, for the air crowd, if they would finally, you know, start doing censored ESCs for the air crowd, uh, so we could have the same, uh, you know, kind of trouble-free, um, timing like the RC race car guys have, uh, where, you know, the censored motors and censored ESCs for the surface crowd, it, it syncs the timing in the, uh, of the motor um, with the ESC, so you never have to adjust the timing in the ESC. It automatically knows what the position of the rotor in the motor is and just let it rip. So that'd be, that'd be pretty nice. What color are my eyes? They're blue, man. <laughs> Uh, Captain Photon, you know, man, listen, that topic is always, that topic is always on the table <laughs> with a <the> pole. Uh, R.C. Stinger, are you familiar with uh, with censored ESCs? So the ESCs that we use, so brushless ESCs come in two different varieties. You've got censored ESCs and censorless ESCs. Uh, most of the ESCs that we use in the air community, in fact, all of them that I've ever seen have been censorless, right? Uh, the in-runner motors that... Uh, that surface guys use, especially in race cars, like on-road and off-road two-wheel drive, your serious racers are using censored motors. And what it has is there's a sensor inside the in-runner that will tell the ESC exactly what the position of the armature is inside the motor can. Uh, and what that does is it's, it eliminates timing issues. Um, you know, so the, the ESC knows exactly what, um, what the position of the rotor is and can start applying power to the three leads, you know, based on the position of the rotor instead of, you know, trying to guess at, at, at what the timing is or, or going off of a fixed timing. It's, it's effectively infinitely variable timing, having a sensor in the ESC and in the motor that are always in sync with each other. Lake Jackson. So 
So I don't have any float planes. Josh, have you seen um, censored ESCs used in airplanes before? Maybe they're using them in drones and like the drone racing. But I, I personally haven't seen them used in airplanes, but I've only been doing the airplanes for, uh, for a few years. See, that's where, like, what Kuniak is saying, you know, that he doesn't see a need for uh, censored uh, motors and ESCs, right? So basically that infinitely variable timing um, or, or constant in-sync timing, you know, between the ESC and the rotor uh, or the armature of the motor, uh, and and maybe there'd be uh, some usefulness for helicopters. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I uh, if I c completely agree with that. Um, you know, because in both in prop planes and EDFs, you know, because we do a lot more throttle management than a than a helo does. You know, so like a helicopter, you basically got what like idle one, idle two. Um, you know, so once you turn your motor on to idle one, you're basically at a fixed RPM and you're doing everything with your, uh, you're doing everything with your collective at that point. The motor RPM doesn't really change. Um, it, you know, same with, uh, it, that's right, Josh, you know, going from a dead stop to moving again. Um, <clears throat> is is where the sensors come into play. So, yeah, uh, I mean, there could be an argument made that once the motor's already moving, do you really need it? Um, and as, even with the slow spool up of a helicopter, I don't know that you need it, you know, because the guys that are using it for, like, racing applications, you know, they're sitting at the stop and that split second that it could take, you know, one ESC to get going while it, you know, figures out what the position of the, of the, uh, you know, if the timing is off by, you know, by a hair, that car is not going to get up and go as fast as one that has a censored motor, you know. So for the guys that are, you know, doing racing where every split second counts, I, I can see you know, why a centered ESC means more to them. Uh, and, and the only reason that I was even bringing that up is because of, you know, kind of that, that weird, you know, just motor cutout uh, with the T-33. It, it just seemed really weird, you know, that it just, it just cut for no reason. Yeah, Jeff, it'll be fun, man. I'm, uh, and Ricky, thanks for coming by, guys. Always appreciated. Hey, make sure on your, on your way out to, to stop by and hit that like button. Check the description, you know, if you feel like, uh, making a small, small contribution. I always leave a, uh, a link in the description to the live shows, guys. I've got a, um, a PayPal link in there. So if you want to make a small contribution to the channel, you certainly can. Uh, it's not a requirement by any means, you know, but uh, every little bit helps and helps us, uh, you know, grab stuff like this, you know, like this AR636 and, and will help with getting me some lights and things like that. Um, so I, I appreciate it. If you guys want to make a, a contribution to the channel, I would, I would love you a long time. Uh, Kenny, it was a it was a split second. 
it was uh, not long at all. Uh, you know, it was like, you know, it was it, it like as the 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 EDF unit was pulling down, so like, uh, it was really weird. I, I suck at making sound effects, so don't ask me to do that over and over again. But uh, it, it just a split second. Like I said, it only did it twice, right? So we're talking, you know, six flights, seven flights. I mean, we're talking 25 minutes, 30 minutes of flight time. I mean, we're talking two split seconds. And it fired right back up. I don't know if it was a signal loss from the radio. Like Guniak said, it could have been a timing issue with the ESC. So as it was spooling down, you know, and then he goosed the throttle again. Maybe the timing was off, so... You know, it caught the motor at that split second where the, you know, where the poles of the, uh, you know, the, the phases of the, of the brushless motor were not in sync with the timing of the, of the rotor inside. Uh, so it didn't catch it right then, uh, you know, but once it kept moving, uh, you know, it bounced right back into, into power. There's no telling. Uh, GB, uh, it, it could have been a radio glitch. Um, it could have been the ESC. Uh, you know, I've been flying with Patrick for a few years now, and I haven't seen that DX. He's running a DX8. Um, and this would be the first time I've seen that radio glitch in the, in the three years, you know, that I've been flying with Patrick. So... Uh, well, Guniak, did you watch the flight video? Um, did it, uh, did the motor sound weird to you? Hmm. Yeah, and, and it, it could be a simple timing, like a programming, uh, a programming change in the ESC, because most ESCs have adjustable timing. Um, you know, I who makes who makes the ESCs for promotion? Is it uh, is it Hobby Wing? Are those rebranded Hobby Wing uh, ESCs that that Free Wing is using? No, it didn't sound like a grinding. Um, I mean, it spooled up nice and smooth every other time. It was just a very quick cutout. It was, yep, woo! You know, I mean, it was... And I'll tell you, I would not let this concern you guys at all. Um, it didn't affect the flight at all. Uh it was only when, when the thing was sitting on the ground. Anytime it was in, I, I did not notice it in the air. It was only for a very split second. I think it was kind of an anomaly. Um, I'm just letting you guys know everything, right? I'm not going to sugarcoat it. So, uh, yeah, I wouldn't be too concerned with it. So, you know, that, that was the only thing that I was that I noticed about the plane that was a little weird. Uh, everything else I thought was fantastic. So, you, you know, don't let that hold you back. If they had a problem with that ESC or whatever, uh, I'm, I'm sure they'll get it taken care of. There's, there's so many different weird factors that it could be that I wouldn't let it, uh, yeah. It hit the ground on purpose on all three wheels every time. So the other thing that I'll tell you guys is, uh, no, no, I just had to get up. One of, one of my planes was crooked on the wall. Um,
Jay Burke, absolutely. That T-33 is absolutely a hangar-worthy airplane. If you like the T-33, if you like the way it looks, you're going to love the way it performs. Uh, I think that everybody, everybody that likes that model should get one, man. It's an awesome performer. Um, it has all the same kind of handling characteristics that you've, you, you've come to expect out of like the Avanti and the L-39. Um, only this time in an American trainer. Uh, you know, yeah, of course we're talking like Vietnam era, but it's still a cool looking airplane. And, uh, and I think people are really going to enjoy it. Uh, Jackson, that was from the wind. They were not running a, uh, that was just a standard Admiral receiver. And it was a pretty windy day yesterday. Um, so any any kind of uh, any kind of tips or you know just small oscillations in the flight that you may have noticed uh, were just turbulence. Uh, it, it was all in the wind. I mean it it, it does get blown around, uh, but it takes it like a champ for the most part, especially for not having a gyro at all. Uh, that thing handled the wind very good, you know, as far as I'm concerned. It was very windy yesterday. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the takeoffs on the model were pretty uneventful, Jeff. Uh, Dennis, I think so. Uh, if you're looking for an 80 millimeter as your as your first EDF, yeah, I I honestly think that that T33 would do very well. Um, you know, right in line as far as recommendations go with the with the Avanti S and the L39, uh, both of which would be great. Uh, first EDF, especially for somebody that's got a lot of experience with like bigger warbirds, already has some big 6S 5000 batteries. Uh, yeah, the 80 millimeter Avanti S L39 and now the T33, I think would all be uh, excellent choices uh, for transition into EDF jets if you've already got 6S batteries. So, absolutely. JCB 67. Wow, 1948. So that's a, that, that even kind of predates uh, the Korean War a little bit. Can I imitate Randy's show with that havoc? What was he doing on his show? Are you talking about like the little thing that we had going yesterday? Like, do you want me to put some coconut oil around the, around the tailpipe and, and, and imitate the, the burst of porn that we had in the corner? <laughs> yeah. You know, we had a... Dude, that was pretty funny. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't remember Randy having... I don't remember Randy having a Havoc, but I remember him having some porn. <laughs> you know, for like one second... There was definitely people doing the nasty. Ah, <laughs> uh, Bobby K. What are you? Are you coming on all your names tonight? I love it.
Oh, that's good. That's good. Josh, you didn't miss anything. The, uh... I, GB, you think Bobby K didn't get a wrench the second he showed up? Of course Bobby K gets a wrench. He just hadn't said anything else yet. Oh, uh-oh. A little bit of thunder from down under. Had that chili last night. They did show some fiery booty. <laughs> there was some kind of booty on there last night, that's for sure. There was a cat getting stabbed. There was a cat getting stabbed on Randy's show last night with a flesh knife. Yes. Yeah. That's not the kind of tools that I put on my show. Oh, was it two flesh knives? I wasn't really paying much attention. <laughs> That's right, Dennis Farley. Were you in the chat when that happened? Because, uh, I, I wasn't paying attention that much, but it may have been too. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. It may it may have been too. <laughs> it may have been real fiery afterwards, Josh. If uh, if there were some, you know, if things were getting spread around, you know what I'm saying? Like it could have burned for sure. It might have needed some penicillin to stop that fire. EQRC, what is up? Baby G, hello, sir. <laughs> so, Josh, have you opened your uh, have you opened your habit yet? Did, were you able to see, Josh, how long have you been in the channel? Did you see when we uh, did the unboxing of the Havoc? I'm assuming that means no, you have not opened. Send Ryan, like, Ryan Ramsey? Ryan Ramsey won't wear a Georgia Tech hat. He lives in Indiana, like right down the street from Notre Dame. Why would he wear a Georgia Tech hat? Nobody likes Georgia Tech except for people that went to Georgia Tech. I'm just saying. <laughs> That's how you know you can spot somebody. Somebody that went to Georgia Tech is because they have, you know, little, little GT logos all over them. We're proud folks. <laughs> nice. Nice, Jeff. Yep, I started going there back in 1994. And it was just as painful back then as it is today, I am sure. Nice, Randy. I love you a long time, too. Sucky, sucky, five dollar. <laughs> All right. 
So, uh, one of the other things that I want to cover, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little bit of. Uh, it was Ryan's hat of choice last night. Giving it to Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice man. Look at all these Georgia Tech folks in here. So Ryan, which Ryan? Ryan Ramsey? You saw Ryan Ramsey wearing a Georgia Tech hat? Are you talking about like Pilot Ryan? Tupac Ramsey. <laughs> Oh, was it a Georgia Tech hat? Yeah, I thought he was I thought he was wearing a beanie. Yeah, Wayne, we still got the havoc back here. My havoc's in fine shape. It's brand new. Yeah, 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 he does wear an RC Jetworks hat. What is Burr editing? <laughs> GB, what are you trying to say, man? That he was looking a little plump, like he was going straight to the to the Hickory Ham Company and stealing some hams. <laughs> what was everybody saying? He looked like Joe Pesci from Home Alone. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he did look a little home alone-ish. Hey, Bobby K, I'm going to put you on the spot. I know that you will never spill the beans on what's coming out here. And, and what are y'all, what, what time are y'all releasing that? As soon as, uh, as soon as Horizon lifts the embargo? So are we talking like midnight, Wednesday night? A, you know, going into Thursday morning, or does it have a... Uh... Welcome to the show, Barry G. I know you've been here a while, but, you know, it's good to have you here tonight. Um, are we talking, like, midnight Thursday, or are we talking, um, you know, like, nine in the morning? Are we talking noon? Are we talking four in the afternoon? You know, what time can we expect the announcement to drop? Thursday morning. All right. So here's my other on-the-spot question for you, Bobby K. Are we going to be more excited for this? Percentage-wise, do you think that more, a larger percentage of the Horizon audience will be excited about the announcement on Thursday than the number of Motion RC fans were about the T-33. I am nosy, man. I got to ask the questions. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I wonder if Bobby's typing or if he's just avoiding the question. Okay. <laughs> no, GB. Not full on cramps, man. This is all wind. It's just it's just dirty wind. I'm not giving away nothing. Man, I gave away this last week. That's it for a while. Till we get to like 500 subscribers, which might be in a couple weeks. By the way, guys, uh, everybody that has subscribed to the channel, you know, I don't get enough uh, opportunity to, to say it, you know, because a lot of... Uh, a lot of times we're just goofing around and all that, but I wanted to take an opportunity to thank everybody that has subscribed to the channel, that tunes into the show every week. Uh, you guys are why I keep doing this, and it's why I will continue to do this and continue to put out great content and continue to do things like making instructional videos on the stuff that nobody else wants to touch. Uh, because I'll tell you, the only good videos that I have seen on the AR-636 are from Horizon, uh, which kind of speaks volumes to how much of a pain in the butt it must really be. Um, so, hopefully, you know, I'll be able to do this thing justice and open some doors for some more people to be able to enjoy this receiver because I still think that it's going to be a relevant product for the next year or so, um, maybe longer, uh, while horizon kind of saturates the market with the ar 637 t uh, i still think that this is going to be a relevant product so um and there's and there's still a ton of them can i see that oh oh dang <laughs> tnrc welcome to the show That's awesome, Goonie Egg. You know, uh, and I hate to say it, but I I have been watching, you know, your videos and seeing, you know, uh, seeing your kind of interaction with electronics. Obviously, you're doing, um, you know, some electronics work with... Um, you know, with making the Guniac fire booty uh, uh, mods for us, the afterburner mods. So, you know, for uh, coming from you, I really appreciate that. Um, you know, that I got you to grab that discharger. That means a lot, man. So, uh, so thank you. Hold on, I'm like looking up. I think you're stepping in some right now. Like, like right now. now. Like. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Guniac. Um, yeah, I mean, that was why I got the thing, you know, because I'll bring, you know, I'll bring 10, 12 packs to the field. And if I only fly, you know, if I'm only able to get seven or eight flights in because the field, uh, you know, at least for me, I, I enjoy the process of interacting with, with pilots as much as I enjoy flying. You know, so if there's a bunch of people there that are asking me questions about their receivers or asking me questions about airplanes or asking me questions about, you know, which servo do I get, um, whatever, people there that need a hand, you know, setting up their airplanes, 
No problem, fireman. You know, I will... <laughs> I will spend just as much time talking to folks as I spend flying a lot of times. Um, you know, so I may only go through a handful of packs. There may be some times when I go out there with all my packs charged and I'll just sit there and fly all day long and and charge them up again while I'm at the field or I'll have, you know, an active rotation of batteries that I'm running through and then I stick them back on the charger and I may go through, you know, a few batteries a couple of times uh, just depending on what kind of day it is. But, you know, there's uh, it's it's often that I'll go home you know, and have three, four, or five batteries that I haven't, you know, gone through that day or that I charged up and I just wasn't able to get to before the lights went out and I needed to discharge them. And that's what turned me on to looking for a really good discharger in the first place, something that wasn't just light bulbs um, or, or just a big freaking resistor. Uh, you know, the load bank on that ISDT discharger is awesome. It gets the job done quick. It discharges at 200 watts. Uh, I mean, that thing is no joke. Um, you know, so you're not going to see a, a 20, 30, 40 amp discharge rate off of a uh, on a 6S battery. Um, you know, but you'll you'll be able to achieve a 200 watt discharge rate no matter how many cells you're running. Um, in fact, the only way you're going to see like the full 25 amps is if you're running like a single cell or a two cell battery. So, um, you know, it's always going to stop at its watt limit uh, when you're discharging a battery. And I think they're fantastic. I mean, you can, you can zip those things down quick. It does not hurt them. Um, you, you know, the one thing I would tell you, Guniac, when you get it... <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, yeah. The region dischargers are great, but like you said, they either require like a big load, uh, they require like a big load bank, like a big resistor bank on the other channel, or you have to have another battery that you're charging while you're discharging that one, which is kind of weird. Um, Jay Burke, give me just a second. Um, and let me find... Let me find a link for that discharger. I think I think this might be cheaper. I think this might be cheaper than it used to be, and that's awesome. I think it's cheaper than it was when I did my uh, initial review on it. So I'm going to be putting a link here in the chat. Uh, and for anybody that's interested, this is the ISDT FD200. It's a 200 watt smart charger or smart discharger. So Josh, it is, it's an ISDT product, uh, but it's a smart discharger, right? It's not one of their chargers. So they make a couple of, um, Randy, did you leave the, uh, the little snuff film, the, the, the like two seconds of, uh, of doinking? <laughs> <laughs> yeah 80 bucks um <clears throat> i have an affiliate link that you could get it from uh you could get it from uh man who the hell is a from banggood but don't order that thing from banggood man get it from amazon they'll have it to you in two days uh and for 80 bucks dude that thing is a steal so it does have an XT60 on it. If you're using EC series connectors, you will need to get like an XT60 to EC3, EC5 adapter. Um, so, you know, the way that I run it on EC5 batteries is I've got an XT60 to EC3 and an EC3 to EC5. 
and uh, my Spectrum Smart Charger has the EC3 connectors on there. So, um, you know, I, I basically run the um, Fly What Yet, Ryan. Welcome back, by the way. <laughs> the Havoc? Yeah, man, I took that thing for a spin around the house real quick. No, man, I just got it. <laughs> I just got it today and took it out of the box. Um, so I haven't had a chance to fly it yet, but I am certainly looking forward to it. I'm going to do my best to not, um, you know, to not put it nose first into the ground. I think in honor of Pilot Ryan and Dave's RC, I'm going to get um, a lawn dart sticker and put it on one side of the airplane, and I'm going to get a sticker of a big-ass pine tree and put it on the other side of the plane, and that will give me some, uh, some good juju that will offer me good luck. That... Uh... <laughs> I'm sure someone else has already turned. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure someone else uh has already turned their uh, their havoc into a big piece of crap. Uh Jeff Henderson, there are a lot of different plug varieties out there. Um, so specifically with the XT series, I know there's an XT30, which is a really small um, uh, version of the, uh, the XT series connectors. Um, and, you know, I, I, I could sit here and show you like, it's about this big, but that's not going to do anything for you. I don't have any to show you as a comparison. And I don't have any XT90s. I've got some XT60s, but uh, most people have seen those. So um, what I do, what I do, Jeff Henderson. <laughs> so uh, I've also got, uh, yeah, so in the XT series, there's the XT30, which is really small. There's the XT60 which is about the same size as an EC3. There's the XT90, which is about the same size and capacity as the EC5. And I believe there's one, I believe it's an XT120. Um, and I wanna say that th those are even bigger still and they split apart. So your positive and negative leads, um, like if you wanted to put two batteries in series, for example, uh, you could take the negative of one battery, plug it into the positive of the other, and then, you know, put the two leads of the separate, you know, so those, the, the positive and the negative of the other two batteries, put them together and just connect the two leads in the center. Like you could run series cells without having to have like a separate connector. Um, that, that larger XT connector is actually pretty cool. Um, <laughs> I think that's what it is, Josh. Is, uh, it, it's, it's more like power poles, if you've ever seen those. It, it, looks, it looks more like that. Um, but yeah, I think there is a bigger series, a bigger version of the XT series connections. They're not yellow, they're red and black. Um, you know, EQ, I, uh, Dean's was a very popular connector when I first got into RC about 30 years ago. <laughs> um, I personally... As far as soldering, or, you know, soldering, soldering, whatever, whatever you want to call it. As far as soldering the connectors go, I, I like using the XT60s. Um, but what I will say is the IC connectors... Um, 
Dang, nice. <laughs> I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure that game gets hot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go, Pilot Ryan. It's XT150. So there's some big, big honkers. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's like a red and black, like big power poles. Uh, you don't want to hook those hook those together, and you know when you're talking batteries of that size, and you know if you have a battery big enough to need that, uh, you're probably going to want like a spark suppressor, you know, in line with that thing. <laughs> um, and the EC connections, I want to say that there's an EC two, which is about the same size as the XT thirty. There's the EC3, which is equivalent to about the XT60, and the EC5, which is about the same as your uh, your XT90. And then you've also got like the IC3 and the IC5. I don't know that they're going to do an IC2. Um, yeah, I was never a big fan of Dean's plugs. Um, I like the, the XT60s, XT90s as as far as ease of soldering, um, you know, but you need the heat shrink. I think with, see you Wayne Lee, thanks for stopping by tonight, man. I think for, um, you know, for the guys that wanna go in that direction, even if you're not using smart batteries and even if you don't need it, um, I think that the IC3 and IC5 connections are much easier to solder, you know, than the previous iteration of uh, like your EC series connectors. And because they're all backwards compatible, I think it opens the door for a lot of people that wanted to use that, but it was such a pain in the butt to solder that they just went over to the XT60s. Now, I think with, you know, because, and that's not even really that true. I, I, I was going to say, I think because the, the, the EC and IC series connectors are kind of almost exclusive to Horizon models, but that's not true. Most of your big 6S jets have EC5 connections. Um, you know, so if you get a battery and you need to put a new connector on it, I would suggest getting the IC5 connector because it's much easier to solder than an EC5. EC5 connectors, you got to kind of pay attention to what. You know, you got to solder the barrel on, you know, the the gold plated barrel that goes into the connector. Um, and, uh, you know, you got to like smash the connector into the blue, you know, the blue housing. And sometimes the way that those barrels are barbed depends on whether you're pushing it in or if you need to have the wire fed through the blue connector first and then solder on the leads and smash the connector on from the other direction. Uh, you know, and that really depends on who you're sourcing your EC5 connectors from and your EC3s for that matter. I, I am not a big fan. Uh, I mean, the soldering of the EC series connectors isn't really any more difficult than soldering anything else. But, you know, smashing the stupid barrels into an EC5 or an EC3 is a pain in the butt, and I hate doing it. So, um, you know, if you're interested in in switching over to EC5, uh, you know, on your batteries, go with the IC connectors. Even if you don't have, um, even if you don't have any smart gear, uh, number one, it's a cool plug. Uh, it's a little easier to get on and off, you know, when you're running like an IC uh, cable on both ends. Hold on. For you guys that aren't familiar with what I'm talking about. All right, so here is a special connector that I made, right? And that... You know, the orange connector there, that is actually an XT60i, uh, which that was the BATGO uh, connector for the ISDT stuff before Smart came out. So BATGO was introduced like in 2017, um, and it just never really took off. You know, so this also uses that third wire, and that's your IC3 uh, connection on the other end. And here is your IC3 
an IC5 adapter, right? So I made all of these guys. Um, and what's nice about them, I think someone had mentioned it, um, instead of having to use heat shrink or whatever, you've got these little caps, these little gray caps. So even on the IC3, you know, so that's an IC3 connector. I mean, as you guys know, so here's like an EC3. Sorry, we're getting all crazy. So there's an EC3 connector there. And your IC3 connector. I mean, as most of you guys are probably aware by now, your EC3 and your IC3s are directly compatible with each other. They'll plug right in, right? The EC3, that has the barrels that you have to solder on to the end of the wire and then smash it into that blue connector. Real pain in the butt. Uh, I usually end up mangling, you know, anytime I'm outfitting some batteries or whatever, if I have to like resolder like five, six batteries, man, I'll, uh, I'll end up mangling. I'll end up with a lot more barrels than I have connectors or than I need for the, for the connectors because I end up mangling three or four of the of those blue housings, you know, while I'm trying to install the uh, install the things. Now, with these IC connectors, I'm going to try to get this off so you guys can see what the inside of that looks like, uh, where you solder it. Uh, you know, if you're familiar with <clears throat> with the uh, how to apply or how to solder up the uh, the the XT series connectors, this is going to look very familiar to you. But first, I got to get the little the little gray cover off. Once that gray cover goes on there, man, it's it's pretty tough to get off. They will come off, but you kind of got to work them a little bit. <laughs> Maybe it'll be easier on this one. Yep. They don't want to come off. <clears throat> well, let me just find a picture of it. Because I think... Ah, uh, you punk. So let's drag this back over here and we'll do a little transition. So what we're looking at here is this is the, uh, I mean, it's a bulk pack of like 25 IC5 connectors, right? Nobody needs that many unless you're just going crazy. Um, dude, Kenny, uh, I've got one of those SMD, uh, rework stations that have like the both the solder uh the soldering iron and the blow gun uh like the heat the heat blower those things are awesome um right so if you guys look at this right like this isn't the ic series connectors so they're a lot different than the old school ec series connectors where now they've got like the two half circles that you can well up a bunch of solder in drop your wire in uh, you know, so you only have to strip maybe, you know, maybe two, three millimeters of insulation off of the end of the, uh, off the end of your wire, solder it into the connector, and then you've got that gray cap that snaps right down on there. So you don't need heat shrink anymore. It's a lot more secure of a solder connection. 
You don't have to worry about smashing the barrel down into the into the housing anymore. It's a much easier uh, it's a much easier solder job than than the previous EC series connector. So, like I was saying, if you're wanting to convert, you know, some of your batteries over to say EC EC five or EC three. Um, you, you know, especially some of the big 6S batteries, almost every every model that um, that's using 6S, especially like your EDFs, most of the EDFs are going to have uh, EC5 uh, connectors on the ESC. So if you want to convert, uh, you know, some of your batteries over to EC5, like I was saying, go with the IC5 connectors. It's It's a lot easier, man. Mitchell, thanks for coming by tonight, man. I really appreciate it. George Watts, you are absolutely correct. Um, so I'll tell you, before I started switching over to like the smart batteries, uh, when I was getting you know, like the cheapest batteries that I could. I think that these came with like Dean's connectors. I didn't give a crap, you know, because I was pretty good with soldering or soldering. I was good with soldering. Um, I was pretty good with soldering that I didn't really care what kind of connector it came with because uh, I started with the EC series connectors. Everything that I had used EC series connectors. So I just soldered EC series connectors onto everything. Um, you know, and if it came with XTs, I cut them off and I put ECs on there. If it came with Deans, I cut them off and put, you know, I, I put what I want on there or what I need. So, um, you know, that was never really an issue for me. So, and, uh, and now with the smart batteries, you know, once you, uh, if you end up adopting like the smart technology, I mean, you're going to get all... IC series connectors anyway, IC3s, IC5s on everything. And I, I'm not sure that they've done a battery yet that they've had to put something as small as... In fact, I don't even know that they're doing an IC2 uh, connector. But if they do, great. Duniac, do, do you actually have it in hand yet or did you order it? Yep, because these things are awesome. These things are awesome. Um, you know, hopefully you were able to, you know, help our guy Ryan out when you ordered it up. But uh... mm -mm -mm. Yeah, all the cells on this battery are sitting about 382, but yeah, I mean, if you guys haven't seen one of these, I don't know if that's going to get any better. Yep. Uh, 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 uh. Crappy webcam. <laughs> anyway, these smart checkers are awesome, guys. Um, and... If you get a chance, you know, once, especially once you start getting like the smart batteries, it's almost like you have to have a smart checker so you can play, well, not really play, uh, but you can alter the settings of your, uh, of your smart chip, you know, so there you can change like your charge and discharge rates, uh, or not your discharge rates. You can set your discharge time, you can set your charge rate. So by default, like the smart batteries are set to charge at um oh ha, ha. thanks thanks kenny i messed up um 
So that smart checker, especially if you're running smart batteries, to me is a must-have. Um, you know, it, it allows you to alter the settings. It allows you to read what's on that smart chip. It allows you to set your charge rates, you know, so if you want to charge it like 1C, 1.5C, 2C, 3C, whatever, uh, you can change that, uh, which just changes the behavior of the smart charger. Once you plug the smart charger in, I mean, it's ready to rock instantly, but you can alter that with the... Uh, the smart checker you can do it with the smart charger too and the other thing that you can do is you can set the time to discharge with the smart checker you can also use it as a servo driver i mean this thing is an incredible little tool uh you know and for 40 bucks i know the isdt has one uh, it cannot change the settings of the smart battery but it does kind of work um but you know yeah, you can get a cheaper one. You can get the, the stuff that they sell on Amazon for like nine bucks and it's gonna work, but this is a lot fancier and it's got a lot more stuff built into it. It can charge your USB devices. I mean, there, there's a lot of functionality in this thing. So, um, yeah, yeah, Guniak, and uh, you know, I know that you can't see it on my screen, but you don't have to have you know, like I've got the balance lead here. You don't have to have that plugged in at all. You know, through the smart wire, it will show you the uh, the cell voltages for each individual cell. And, you know, I mean, you're just not going to see it on this crappy camera. Because all it is is a junky webcam. But you can kind of see it there a little bit. There it is. You can see like the individual cell voltages uh, without having your, I mean, there's my balance lead right there, right there, guys. So it'll show it when you're using smart batteries. It's good stuff. Yeah, the USB charge function works. Uh, you know, the smart checker works just as well with um, with dome batteries as it does with smart batteries you know so your USB functionality being able to do USB charge being able to do cell balancing uh, being able to um, do servo checking uh, being able to, to just measure your cell voltages so here's here's a non smart battery here you know, you just plug in your balance lead. And I'm still able to get, you know, I'm still able to read that even on a non-smart battery. And if I plug in, you know, a non-smart battery, I've still got the ability to charge USB devices, right? So I don't need a smart battery to be able to use all the functionality. What the smart checker does and the way that it interfaces with that smart technology in the batteries is to be able to, to read it, see how many times you've charged the battery, how many times the battery's gone into an overcharge or undercharge cycle, how many total charge cycles do you have on it, has it ever been overheated, um, and you can also set the charge rates and the automatic discharge function, like how long to wait before it goes into its automatic uh, storage charge feature, you know, which can be anywhere from like, uh, I think you can set it as low as a, a, like two hours all the way up to like, to, I don't know. Let's take a look. It's a pretty wide range. Um, you know, you can get it down really low and you can get it up pretty high. So. I know by default, I think that they're actually set to off for auto discharge, which in some ways is a little bit amusing because Spectrum, you know, talks that up as being one of the big features of the battery. So if that's the case, then why is it turned off by default? You know, good question, right? So auto storage, for me, my auto storage is set to 48 hours. You can run it, it'll go as low as 12 hours, and I think as high as 240. Yeah. 
So anywhere from the auto discharge or auto storage charge function, you can have to start as low as 12 hours um, from the time that it, it hasn't seen any action uh, to as high as 240 hours. So why you'd want to wait 10 days, I have no idea. Uh, you're going to do a lot of damage to your battery if you leave it fully charged for 10 days before you discharge it. And to be quite honest, the reason that I still recommend a discharger is that the small chip that's in here discharges this battery at such a low discharge rate that if you've got a six cell pack, um, you know, that's running, what, 25 volts at a full charge, to get it down to storage voltage is still going to take this thing quite a while. You know, because it's discharging at like half a watt, you know. to I mean, if it was discharging any higher than that, it would burn the board up. Um, so, you know, even though it does do self-storage charge, which is a good safeguard, it is, it doesn't take the place of a good discharge function, right? So, if you can run the battery through the plane, that's obviously the best choice. Um, and... If not, then I would still run it on a discharger uh, just to get the voltage off the cells because you don't want to leave a fully charged battery sitting for too long. That is the most harmful thing that you can do to a LiPo cell is leave it at a full charge. <clears throat> yeah, so as far as the features that we can change, like the smart technology, and you guys aren't going to be able to see it on the screen, so I'll just tell you. Um, you know, what I'm able to, <clears throat> to view as far as what's in the smart chip of the battery, I'm able to, to alter the storage charge, um, you know, to, the time before it goes to storage charge. I'm able to check the storage voltage. I can alter what I want the storage voltage to be. So I can set that anywhere from 3.8 volts all the way down to 3.6 volts. So if I want to have it sitting at 3.6 volts, it's at storage voltage. I can set that. I have mine set to 3.80. Uh, I can alter the charge current, which I can run as high as 12 amps, uh, which on this battery, this is a 4050C, uh, which is rated for a 3C charge capacity, right? So 12 amps for this battery is correct at 3C. And I can set the charge current as low as 0.1 amp. Um, by default, this battery was set at a 6 amp charge current, so 1.5C, which is where I leave it. Uh, I can also change where I want the charge voltage to sit uh, in my smart settings. So this, this is what is programming your charger. So you don't have to go in there and tell the charger, like, okay, I've got a 6S battery, and I want it to charge at this many amps. All that's in the battery. So with the smart chargers, you just plug it in and go. The battery tells the charger what the settings need to be at. So it's a much more, you know, plug and play type of scenario. So, you know, I hope that, uh, I hope that more people adopt it, man. Uh, I think that the sale that Spectrum did and the reason that I have this silly, uh, Michael Honeychuck, welcome to the show. The reason I have this silly plane sitting behind me is because they gave me a 5000, uh, a 6S 5050C battery with it, which is a great battery. Yeah, Jim. Uh, and the thing that I like about, um, about using, Michael Honeycheck, welcome to the show. The thing that I like about using the, um, the smart checker as a servo driver is well and i know that that a lot of those servo drivers like the old servo checkers they had like a little toggle switch on the side right where you could set it you know to be either cycling or you could set it to the center or whatever but it really didn't tell you that much else you know the nice part about these smart checkers is not only does it you know can you center it you can move that centered value uh, you can have it run you know, continuous, but it also tells you how much current that servo is pulling, you know, so you can see in milliamps how much current that servo is pulling uh, through the circuit, which is a invaluable tool, especially if you're trying to, 
determine what size ESC you need, or I'm sorry, what size BEC you need for a particular model. So say you have a big model that has like 12 servos in it, um, and every servo is running, you know, five, 600 milliamps, you know, you need a lot bigger than a four amp BEC at that point, you know, you need, you need like a six amp or a seven, eight amp BSC or a, a BEC, sorry. Um, so that's another great use for the servo checker. There's a lot of functionality built into this thing for 40 bucks, guys. It's an awesome, awesome tool. See you, Ken. Or is that, sorry, man. I thought that was, I thought that was Kenny leaving. Bledsoe left us. See you, buddy. Yeah, George, watch. I think that a lot of folks do, especially on big, big models, you know, where they may have like those power save receivers, um, you, you know, on like 12 and 20 channel radios, uh, and, and they may run multiple receiver batteries. Um, <laughs> thanks, Ken. Uh, they may run multiple receiver batteries uh, just in case one fails. Um, and and that's where those big things come in but uh you know it it still doesn't take away from kind of the cool factor that uh that this tells you how much current you're pulling from a servo you know under load so you know if you can see that you've got a servo that's pulling like way more than you would expect you know so you know, a servo may only every other servo in your plane is only pulling say 250 milliamp but you got one that's pulling one amp, you know, well, now you've got a good idea that that servo, even though it may be moving, it's either jammed up really good or something's wrong with it, right? So that, that's, that's more of the, the invaluable function uh, with the smart checker. Oh yeah, something's definitely wrong, you know? So uh, everybody should get one, man. It, it, is, it, it is a lot of functionality. It's a lot of tools in your toolbox. Uh, and it's really cool, uh, you know, the way that it displays everything that you would normally have to cycle through a lot of functionality on, like the really cheapy Amazon, um, you know, style or, you know, Chinese style uh, battery checkers is all on that initial screen. So as soon as you plug in your balance lead, you know, two seconds later, uh, all of your information is there on the screen. And we're talking all the cells, up to eight cells. Uh, it tells you all your cell voltages. It tells you what your battery capacity is. It tells you what your percentage is at. Uh, the only thing that it doesn't, I'm trying to think of what it doesn't give you on that initial screen. And I'm pretty sure it gives you everything. Uh, it gives you everything you need. The, everything that you can get from a regular battery checker is on that initial landing screen as soon as it pops up after you plug a balance lead in. So it's very nice. Nice, Kenny. This is a Spectrum product that's worth the money. I'll tell you that right now. This Spectrum product is worth the money. <laughs> you may not like the radios, but you're going to love the Smart Checker. And, Kenny, the other thing that's going to be neat is now that you have a Smart Battery, uh, you got one of the uh, you got one of the Havocs too with the 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 six S five thousand fifty Cs. Yeah, yeah. So if you got one of the six S five thousand fifty C batteries, yeah, man, um, go ahead. Uh, you're you're gonna like it even more. Uh, you are going to need an adapter, you know, kind of like this one right here, which is an EC5. Uh, I think it's an EC5. Yeah, EC5 device to EC3 battery connection. So the EC3 would plug into the smart checker. The EC5 is where your battery will plug in. Get you one of these little adapters. I think they're like six bucks or something like that, or you can make your own uh, if you're feeling saucy. Um... 
and this will allow you to alter the the smart configuration and like the self re uh, or, or the self discharge functionality of the battery because like I said I believe by default the um, the oh did you get the EC1500 too I, I believe by default the self discharge function is turned off uh, when you first buy the battery so you've got to turn it on um, and you can't do that without either a smart charger or a smart battery checker it's either turned off or it's set to like 240 hours which just seems ridiculous to me Like, who, who's going to wait 10 days to discharge their battery? You know, like, they, they, they tell you that you... Uh... <laughs> it, it just seems silly. It really is, George Watts. It seems like every month, every month, something is coming up for somebody. Um, you know... These last couple of months have not been, well, that, and that's not true. The, I say the last couple of months haven't been for me. Bullshit, man. The SU-30, that thing is badass, and I want to get one. Um, the, um, wasn't a big fan of the airliner. Wasn't a big fan of the Twin Otter. But I, I like the T-33. Now that I've seen one in person, man, I think I want to get one. And when frickin' Ryan and, and BitGo Bobby go live on frickin', are they doing a live show Thursday? Did they say they're doing a live show Thursday at like 8 o'clock? So if they do a live show, um, and whatever they're showing is badass, God damn it! I get paid Friday. Pre-order, motherfuckers. <laughs> Right. So I'm really hoping I'm really hoping that it's not that it's not awesome and I don't feel compelled to press the buy now button. But uh but I just might. You never know, man. <clears throat> yeah, I still gotta get I still gotta get lights for the show. You know, and that's like 180 bucks for two, like, LED panel lights. Um, and, and I feel like I need to do that before airplanes. But this show is not about lights. You know, this show is about airplanes. So even if you can't see them that good, man, the lights are good enough. The lights are good enough. We can still have airplanes without lights. <laughs> yeah, man. Hey! Sorry, I had to yell at my cat. My fucker was trying to scatch some stuff. Um, so, yeah, we don't need... Yeah, we don't, we don't need lights to be able to show you the airplanes. And, guys, I know that everybody knows that this is a havoc. And I know that the color reproduction of my camera is not the best and the lighting in here is a little cool uh, as far as like color temperature and stuff like that goes. If you guys are into like, you know, photographic lighting and all that stuff. Um, and even the photos on the box do not... Don't do this green justice, man. Um, the green of the Havoc is pretty sweet. I've been giving it trash. I've been trashing the green color of this plane ever since it came out because I wasn't holding it in my hands. But now that I've got it in my hands, it's like goblin green. And I feel like I need to get like a picture of a nasty green goblin, you know, to go like right here on the front of the plane. You know, like, that'd be awesome. It, maybe it's time to call Callie and be like, I need some green goblins to put 
right on the side of the plane. You know, that'll look awesome right when I'm crashing it. <laughs> but it really is a great, it's a great looking color. I really didn't like the green in the pictures. And even as I'm sitting here looking at it right now, you know, I'm sitting here looking at the screen and I, I can see what you guys see as far as color reproduction to the camera. It looks like crap. But the actual green is like this cool, this, this is a cool color. This is a cool looking green. It might look like crap, but I'm telling you, this is a good looking plane. It didn't, it didn't take much time to grow on me at all. You know, I think Ryan was saying, oh, the green will grow on you. No, you just need to see the green with your own eyes, man. It is a, uh, it's a sweet looking plane. I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> and, and I don't know where to hang it on like my wall of shame over here. I think I'm gonna have to hang it over there with uh, with the F-18. I, I don't want to put it I don't want to put it too close <laughs> Kenny that's uh, I forgot that I also have to get a sticker of a lawn dart and a sticker of a tree and a sticker of a goblin so I need a goblin a lawn dart and a tree you know for both sides <laughs> so I can pay tribute to Dave's RC and pay tribute to Ryan uh, as mine is flying around. <laughs> oh, Guniak will appreciate this. My Harbor Freight ammo cans. Oh, those Harbor Freight ammo cans are awesome, man. Uh, I have a lot of stuff that I use for my RC toolkit that I get from Harbor Freight. Because a lot of their, like, their, their smaller tools, man, they sell them so cheap. Like a pick set, they sell for like 99 cents. Uh-oh. Yeah, that's my battery bunker. I mean, if they can hold 50 caliber bullets, I'll trust my batteries in them. <laughs> that might not be the best plan. But they do work well. So yeah, I, I get so much crap from Harbor Freight. I mean, it might smell like, you know, nasty burned rubbers. And I'm not talking about tires. You know what I'm saying? It may smell nasty when you walk into Harbor Freight, but the deals are so good that I just let my nose suffer. <laughs> I don't know if the Harbor Freight's where y'all live. Um, <laughs> yeah, my gym. I was going to say, do all Harbor Freight smell like that? Or just the ones in Georgia? Because the, of the three Harbor Freights here in Georgia that I go to regularly, they all smell identical. You know, and at first I was like, oh, it must just be this one Harbor Freight. And then I went to a different Harbor Freight and I was like, damn, that one smells weird too. And then I went to another one over by my office and that one smells weird too. Like, what the hell's going on? Why do Harbor Freight smell so funky?
Randy, that, that is retarded. When, when my batteries blow up, I don't want them to vent, man. I want this thing to turn into a shrapnel bomb. That'll be awesome. I'm just kidding. You're, these guys are right. You should be drilling a hole in your battery box. <laughs> now, now, personally, I drill the hole in the bottom, not the top. Um, because that way, if any moisture gets in there, you can... Um, Oh, the brand new one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can imagine how a brand new one smells all right. Yeah, if any moisture or any water gets into your battery box, you know, put the holes on the bottom. The holes on the bottom will still vent because there's, like, some standoffs, you know, built into the box a little bit. Um, yeah, that way the moisture can get out or any water can get out. And, you know, if your batteries do vent uh, or go through any kind of, uh, what do they call that? Uh, there used to be a runaway, uh, I forget, I forget what the terminology was, that thermal runaway event, something like that. Like if you short out a LiPo battery, even for just a moment, uh, the chemical reaction that starts is pretty awesome. It's not thermal detonation. <laughs> but it is <laughs> it is very interesting to watch um, Dustin what's going on man I think it's a thermal runaway event is the, uh, the, the technical terminology for a lipo that's gone into like thermal runaway uh, oh yeah yeah it, it goes quick um, but that thing will be like throwing fireballs. Uh, it'll be doing a lot of stuff, but it doesn't like it doesn't explode like a brick of C four. But it's pretty exciting. There you go. Yeah, there you go. I th that's what I thought. I thought it was like thermal runaway. Um, it does produce fire. It's like it's awesome. It's awesome to watch. It's awesome to witness, but don't stand too close to it because they can like throw fireballs out uh, and don't do it to your own batteries. Um, it's not something that I would recommend for like some amateur guy that doesn't know what he's doing. Um, you know, don't do that. But, um, you know, if you just want to, I mean, for look, there's plenty of videos on YouTube of people driving a nail through a lipo battery. Go watch one if you want to see what happens. Um, you know, but that's why anytime that you see like a lipo battery getting crushed, if you understood like the construction of a lipo battery and what's going on and how close the layers are, you know, so when we look at the outside of a lipo battery and we see the positive and the negative wire and the insulation and all that stuff, when we get into the internal construction of a lipo cell and how, you know, how it's wrapped up inside that thing, the positive and negative, you know, I mean, they're fractions of a millimeter next to each other. So when you crush a lipo cell, you know, if you happen to break through, uh, you know, the internal insulation material between, you know, the anode and the cathode, uh, within the the you know the 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 layers as the lipo is rolled up, if you happen to penetrate that anywhere within the layers of the cell, you're going to go into a thermal runaway event and cause that thing to to catch fire. So you know if you crash a plane or something, if that lipo is even a little bit um, deformed, I mean salt water bath that bitch. Get it out of there. You don't want to use it again. It's not worth the risk. Get rid of it. Oh, I've seen that too, Guniak. You know, back when I used to work on uh, on on car electrical systems, like like twelve volt electrical systems. 
I may have, you know, in in haste one time when removing the negative terminal of a GM battery, I had a little tool, you know, it was like a ratcheting wrench that had like the rubber insulator over it, that the tool itself wasn't long enough to reach all the way over to the other uh, pole of the battery. And I was like, man, I don't have time to grab that thing. So I just grabbed a regular box end wrench and I think it's like an eight millimeter. Um, I think it's an eight millimeter to loosen up the, the terminals on a GM battery. And I straight up shorted the, uh, the positive and negative terminals of a, of a brand new battery. And, uh, it created quite the, the arc and spark show and, uh, and welded that wrench you know while the battery is like arcing and sparking everywhere the the wrench was welded in place so it's not like we could pry it off or anything you know you just kind of had to wait until uh until the show was over but that was that was one of my many you know stupid electrical accolades <laughs> it was it was awesome and uh you know i will also mention that this this was in a car while that was happening that was pretty dumb. <laughs> not one of my smartest movements. <laughs> not, not one of my best days in the, in DC. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was not. Uh, I wasn't too thrilled. I got a lot of shit that day, and I had to pay for a new battery. And uh, a lot, uh, now thankfully, we blew the main fuses, you know, coming out of the, coming out of the battery terminal of the positive of the battery for the car. So uh, it didn't do a lot of damage to the car aside from the battery. Uh, and I had to replace a bunch of fuses and relays, but, you know, it ended up only costing like a couple hundred bucks because that could have been easily, if that thing would have caught fire, uh, That'd have been an insurance claim, man. There's no way I could have afforded to to fix that shit. You can, Dennis Farley. I have tried it before. It works. <laughs> Put the negative lead up and and grab your welding stick. <laughs> you have zero control over how much current you're pulling through it, but it does work for spot welds. Pow! Woo, Fred Barron. Woo! Mm. That. That just sounds terrible. That sounds terrible. I can't even imagine what that would have been like. Mm-hmm. That hurt me. And I wasn't even there, man. Like, that, that hurts just to think about. They're making 36 volt Trojans. And I thought the Magnum Extra Large was as big as they got. Oh, you know, something else that I got. I got to find it. I think it's right here. I've got an interesting scar that, uh, I, don't, I can't, I can't, I mean, I see it. It's right here. You can't really see it, you know, with this camera and the lighting, but I've got a scar 
like right here, and it's where I had a welding gun, a 200, uh, it was a 200 watt welding gun, or not welding gun, soldering gun that I was using uh, in the cars when I was working on car electrical systems, you know, and this was back before I joined the Navy. One of those big ass weller, you know, like you pull the trigger and, and the whole front end like just glows red. Um, you know, so I'm sitting there working on the the tail lights and stuff in the trunk. Um, you know, getting getting all the wiring and stuff ready. Uh, we were doing a restoration of a vehicle, and I was doing all the brake lights and reverse lights and all that stuff. You know, so I'm soldering everything in, and I set the soldering gun on like I had uh, like a piece of. Um, you know, like a piece of fiberboard or, you know, like the the backing board of like a clipboard, you know, like that real thin, you know, real rigid board material that we were, we had cut out to sit down in the tray of the trunk and we were going to put a carpet liner on it. I had that sitting down there and I was just setting the soldering gun on it and I went in there to like go up and look at something else and just sat my arm right on the top of that soldering gun. And it was so hot that I didn't even feel it at first. I smelled it and then looked down and was like, ah, and pulled my arm back. Uh, and it had like, you know, just, it, it was instant, like third degree burns on my arm. I mean, the, the whole thing was just black. I mean, it, it barbecued my arm, man. It was awesome. Kevin Farrows, welcome to the show. Oh, oh, be gloving your finger. Red, that, that just sounds terrible. Well, oh, <laughs> George, what? <laughs> Yeah, I think everybody's got like a story of something really stupid that they did in their life. You know, whether it relates to electricity or, I mean, I've done plenty of stupid electrical things. I've been popped by every, and uh, you know, a lot of what I did in the Navy was dealing with electrical circuits. Um, you know, so I've been popped by uh, every type of electricity that exists on a ship. You know, I've been popped by 120 volt, 60 hertz, 240 volt, 60 hertz. Uh, I think it was 600 volt, 400 hertz. That hurts a little bit. Low current, but, uh, you know, high voltage, high frequency, and it burns. Um, I've been popped by a lot of, uh, a lot of different electrical, <laughs> electrical outputs. Wreckham Roy, is that the biplane? Yeah, yeah, that was one that I never got hit by, Michael Honeychuck. I never got hit by like three phase 400, like 400 amp um, lines. Uh, R.C. Stinger, I was a fire control technician, so a lot of my gear uh, ran off of uh, off of the different circuits that were available on the ship. Um, you know, the electrician's mates uh, were the ones that generated all the electricity. I just like to play with stuff that plugged into it. Oh, 440 will blow you up. Yeah. And I think we were running, on the Virginia-class submarines, we were running five, 
three phase 440 lines onto the ship, maybe six. And I know the surface ships, you know, like the big destroyers, big cruisers, man, you'd see 20, 30 shore powers, big 440 lines uh, running over to the ship and aircraft carriers. I mean, they'd take up three or four shore power bunkers, um, it, you know, which the shore power bunkers, I think, had eight each, you know, so those guys are running 40 or 50 um, big 440 amp, you know, three phase lines into the ship. Uh, and that's just insane to me. It takes a lot of power to run an aircraft carrier. So, Randy, I, I think that the guy that Fred Barron is talking about right there, we saw him um, in your live stream last night. <laughs> Bill. <laughs> I know what that guy's talking about. We used to tell that joke when I was about eight years old. And no one did know what the serial number was. Like, did they really have a serial number? <laughs> They sure do, but you've never been that far. I don't think it's a serial number, though. I think it's a lot number. <laughs> right? Right, Kenny? Yep, I've been married for a long time. I haven't rolled it down at all for like 15 years. Yeah, I think it's only supposed to go around the the shaft part. <laughs> you don't have to try to, you know, you don't have to try to pull it over the twigs and berries. All right, Jim. <laughs> Thanks for coming out tonight, guys. So, yep, we've been going for a little while. We're at like two hours and, and some minutes and, uh, you know, dingleberries. Wait, wait, dingleberries are the ones in the back. You don't want dingleberries up front. That's not the kind of berries that you get on the twig. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Grapes. So, I uh, am am horribly tired, guys, and. Uh, I gotta, I gotta get some sleep. I actually have to be up in about oh three more hours for a nice fancy conference call with my office. We're doing some, we're doing some maintenance on some routers at like two o'clock in the morning, which will be awesome, and I'm really looking forward to it. But uh, it was awesome hanging out with you guys as it is every night. Uh, you know, be sure to leave uh, on your way out. Hit the like button. Um, hit the thumbs up, 
If you're not subscribed to the channel already, hit the subscribe button, ring the bell. Uh, if you guys want to make a small contribution to the channel, check out the description for this live show. And there's a, a link for PayPal if you want to make a, a little donation to the channel to help us get more fancy things and, uh, and get some lights so I can keep buying airplanes <laughs> instead of lights. Um, when, the, when the copper coils look really dark in my motor... Uh, Reckham, are you talking about a brushless motor or a brushed motor? I will, I will get through this last question. Thanks, Reckham Roy, you just ruined everything. I'm trying to sign off and this motherfucker's still asking questions. <laughs> hey, no problem, George. No problem. Anytime you guys, uh... You know, it doesn't matter when you get here, as long as you get here. So I appreciate it every time. Thank you so much. Brushless Outrunner. So typically, you know, when the coils start getting really dark, that's usually a sign of carbon deposits. But you usually don't see that anywhere near as bad with a brushless motor as you would with a brushed motor because obviously with a brushed motor you know as the armature and the commutator of the armature start to grind away on the brushes the brushes are made out of graphite or carbon or some you know material and they just generate mounds and mounds of carbon dust and you would have to clean those brushed motors you know every five six runs and wash all the garbage out of them and they were just terrible um, with a brushless motor, that could just be from heat buildup over time because the copper, uh, you know, typically the copper, after the windings have been put on the magnets or, or on the on the the on the rotors, um, you know, when the copper windings have been wound on, uh, they'll typically dip them in a coating, and that coating you know, will deteriorate over time and get oxidized and things like that. So um, I would say that what's happening is, uh, you know, that the the coating over the copper has has become oxidized and worn out to the point that it's just time to replace the motor. They don't last forever, um, you know, and, and they're not built... The, well, I, I mean... I wouldn't worry about I'd just replace the whole motor. Just just dump it and get a new one. <laughs> right? See ya, Eric. I, I wouldn't run it anymore, Roy. Um that's just me. If you're burning through a battery in two minutes uh, and you're probably you're probably overloading that motor too. Um, you know I can't remember what the tool is, and I'll, I'll have to find it. There is a tool out there on the internet. It is absolutely awesome, uh, and I used it when I was doing flight test planes. And I would put in like, you know, this is the size motor I need, and this is the size. You know, this is how fast I want to go. This is how many batteries I want to run. Like, am I running 3S, 4S? Um, and it would tell me, like, okay, so based on that, you need this kind of motor, and you need this kind of prop, and you're going to be pulling, you know, if you're running, and you need to be running, like, a 60-amp ESC, and you're going to pull, like, 40 amps from it, and you'll still have 30% headroom on the ESC or whatever. It was an awesome tool. I... I can't remember what the uh, what the name of that website was though off the top of my head. I'll have to do some research uh, to remember the name of that because that's something that I think would be awesome to go over on like the next show is uh, or on a show at some point is going over um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, going over, like, how do you choose the right motor and the right prop 
you know, to be able to achieve, you know, this many amps at whatever. Kenny, that doesn't mean that it's good. <laughs> you sh Just because you can doesn't mean that you should. I cuss at my mom. It doesn't make it right. <laughs> All right, guys. Again, thank you so much for uh, for coming to the show. It's always been a blast. I, I love doing this for you guys. So you know, keep coming every week, and I will keep uh, I will keep putting them on. Um, I don't know what we got for you next week, but I'm sure we'll have something good. Uh, in the meantime, um, again, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell. Look in the description, you know, click on that PayPal link if you want to shoot me over a couple of bucks so we can buy some lights for the studio. That'd be awesome. Um, and we will see you guys next week. Um, yeah, yeah, no problem, Roy. And anybody, you know, that needs me, needs to ask me any questions, you know, during the week, find me on Facebook. Find me on social, you can find me on Instagram, you can find me on Twitter. Hit me up any way you know how. Uh, and I randomly pop up throughout the week on other people's live streams and Zoom chats and whatever. So I'm always out there, guys. Or leave a message in one of my, uh, one of my previous videos, man. I, I usually answer on every comment so far because my channel's still young. When I have a thousand subscribers and it's hard to keep up, maybe not. But anyway, it's been a pleasure, you guys. Everybody have a great night. And we will see you guys next week. Thanks for tuning in. Oh my God. I am the worst at YouTube. I don't know how to stop the stream. They changed everything. Anyway, good night guys. We'll see you guys next week.